We've, we've spent a lot of time this semester so far looking at how to get data as signals across a link and more recently how to make sure that that data is delivered correctly in the presence of errors. We have, for example, error detection, error correction, retransmissions, and to make sure that we deliver the data efficiently, we have flow control mechanisms. So we've been focusing on links. We're going to move on today, but the last thing we want to talk about links is multiplexing. And the concept's very simple. Even though there may be 10 or 15 slides, it only takes us 10 or 15 minutes to cover this topic. We'll talk about the main concept. What do we mean by multiplexing? The concept is if we have a link from A to B, right? we have a link from A to B, we, we know the techniques for getting data from A to B. We know that we transmit a signal, that signal has, is at a range of frequencies and it usually we denote some centre frequency, so if we've seen plots like this in the frequency domain, we transmit a signal, that signal has some bandwidth. In this picture, I, the, the width of the green shape is our bandwidth, and we have a center frequency, and we encode that data, the zeros and ones, using one of many different techniques we've studied. We've looked at uh, shift keying techniques, amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, we've looked at uh, non-return to zero, Manchester encoding and so on, other encoding techniques. The media that we have available, we've looked at examples of wired and wireless media, it could be a cable or we could be sending a radio wave wirelessly. So we send signals to carry our data from A to B. The question arises is if we have more than one piece of data we want to send across the same link, how do we do it? And the scenario you can think of is instead of A being a single computer, think of we have A as one location like our campus here, B is at Rungsit campus. We have multiple users, multiple users here on our campus and we want to communicate with multiple users at the Rungsit campus. How do we do that? How can we send the data of multiple users from one location to another? Well, the first approach, how can we support multiple users? Give every pair of users their own link. For example, if, as a simple case, there are four people or four users or four computing devices here at Bunker D campus, and they want to send to a corresponding device at Rungsit campus. Then one approach we could do to support multiple users is each pair has their own link, maybe their own cable from computer source A to so destination A at Rungsit and then from another source at Bunker D to another destination at Rungsit and so on. For every user that wants to communicate, have your own cable. It'd be like you have a cable to someone you want to send to at Rungsit and everyone else in the class has their own cable. I think you can see that that's not very efficient use of resources. We, we're not scale very well as we add more people. We can't have a separate link for every pair of users. Okay, that, so the concept, every pair of users has a link between them and they transmit their signal. So in this picture I show the signal. For example, source A transmits a signal carrying its data to destination A, where that signal has some bandwidth, B, and is centered about some frequency, F1. And we get the signal and we've received the data. And at the same time, the good thing about this approach, everyone having their own cable, is that we can all transmit signals at the same time, in parallel, getting our separate data to the destinations, and if the cables are designed correctly, they will not interfere with each other. Okay, so the good thing here is that we can transmit a signal along the cable from the two blue uh, computers, and at the same time, another signal between the two green computers, they can be using the same range of frequencies, they're both centered on F1, the same bandwidth, 
but they will not interfere because the way we design the, the media is such that they will not interfere with each other, especially with wired media, and similar with others. Of course, it's very wasteful of resources. We have a, a cable for every pair of users wanting to communicate, and it's hard to expand. Deploying cables is expensive. I want to have a link from here to Rungsit. Well, let's say it's a wired link. If I want to build a new, put a new link in, I need to dig a hole under the ground or at least pay someone who has some, some conduits under the ground to, to lay my cable through. And that's actually quite expensive if you want to cover across an entire country, then digging the hole under roads, under cities is a, a very expensive task and we don't want to have to do that very often. So having a cable per user just in most cases doesn't make sense, especially when we cover uh, long distances. So what multiplexing is about is taking the data from multiple users and sending it on one cable or one link in general. And there are two main approaches. So the approach in general of multiplexing from our two locations, say Bunkadi and Rungsit, we have one link between the two locations and we introduce a special device at each endpoint. So we have our sources and our destinations. Each source has data to send. They send it to this special device, a multiplexer. And the multiplexer combines the signal from those four sources and creates one output signal that goes across the link. So the signals from the four sources are going to be combined in some manner and then sent, the multiplexer will send a sig single signal to the demultiplexer across the link and the role of the demultiplexer is to take the received signal and then extract the data and send it to the correct destination. The data from source A or the signal from source A needs to be sent to destination A and so on. That's our, our concept of multiplexing. We use a multiplexer and demultiplexer or mux and demux. Somehow we need the multiplexer to combine the four to produce one output signal. So there are two basic approaches. One is that we combine the signal using a different set of frequencies and that's called frequency division multiplexing and the second approach is we combine the signals by transmitting at different times for each user, time division multiplexing. Let's look at them. Recall, think each user has data to send but focus on the, the data from the perspective of the signal. Each user has a signal to send to carry their data. It has some bandwidth B. And let's say it's centered about some frequency, F1. Maybe F1 is uh, 10 kilohertz, and the bandwidth may be uh, 5 kilohertz. So the, the bandwidth says it ranges from one frequency up to another, centered on F1. And they all have the same bandwidth for this uh, example. What we do with frequency division multiplexing is that those four sources send their signal to the multiplexer, bandwidth B, all the same, center frequency F1, and the multiplexer creates one signal that comes out which combines the four signals from the sources in such a way that they are shifted to different center frequencies. You can think this is the signal being transmitted by the multiplexer at the first range of frequencies contains the original signal from source A, centered in this case at frequency F1. The signal from source B, which previously was centered at F1, is being shifted and is centered at F2, but it has the same bandwidth. And for source C, it's at F3 with the same bandwidth, and at source D, F4, the same bandwidth. The idea is that we can transmit one signal, but that signal actually contains the signals of those four different users. We must transmit them at different frequencies because if we transmitted everyone's signal at the same time, at the same frequency, that all overlap with each other and effectively interfere with each other. It's the same as is everyone talks at the same time in this room, we're all transmitting at the same frequency, 
so you'll all interfere with each other and I will not be able to hear you or you will not be able to hear me. So what we could do, transmit signals at the same time but at different frequencies. And the role of the demultiplexer is to extract the individual signals and send them to the corresponding destinations. So what it receives around the F1 frequency, it sends to destination A. What it receives in around the F3 frequency sends to destination C. So this is one way to combine the signals from the multiple users and send across one link. The signal sent across that link from multiplexer to demultiplexer has a bandwidth of at least four times B in this example. The bandwidth of each user, their signal is B, B hertz. If we're going to combine them and make sure they don't overlap, then we need a bandwidth of at least four times B. And in practice, we usually have some spacing between those signals so that they are not exactly on top of each other, but there's some spacing so it's greater than four times B. Normally. That is, the signal sent between the multiplexer and demultiplexer across our link has to be four times the bandwidth of the signals from the original users. Larger bandwidth, we know, has a higher cost. We generally want to minimise the bandwidth. This scheme requires a higher bandwidth here. If we have a thousand users, then it will be a thousand times B, a thousand times the bandwidth of each individual user. That's one of the issues with using this approach. We need to, if we have a bandwidth, a fixed bandwidth for this link, it determines how many users we can support at a particular bandwidth for that, that user. This concept is commonly used, uh, and you see uh, the similar concept used in, in wireless systems or cable TV. For example, cable TV, the TV, there's one cable, a, a coaxial cable that comes into your house. But the signals from multiple TV stations are sent along that one cable. And they're sent at different frequencies. So they don't interfere with each other. And all your TV does is tunes in to the right frequencies. It filters out. So cable TV is similar except there's a, a single destination but multiple sources. But the way that it combines the signals from the multiple TV stations is using frequency division multiplexing. You give a different frequency to each TV station. The frequencies used in this panel are also referred to as we assign channels. So we may say this is channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, channel 4. And you know that in TV and radio stations they are assigned channels or channel numbers in many cases. And that's meaning it's at a particular center frequency and using frequency division multiplexing. Another view of that, uh, the concept of frequency division multiplexing is shown here, where we transmit the data from all users at the same time, so on the same time scale, but we transmit using different frequencies. So the channels correspond to frequencies in this case. This is a case where, say, we have six users. We have six channels. We transmit their data at the same time, but using a different frequency for each. If, for example, we have our link and it has the link has a bandwidth of The total bandwidth equals 100 kilohertz, and the bandwidth per user is 15 kilohertz. That is, each user generates a signal which occupies 15 kilohertz but our link from A to B has a bandwidth available of 100 kilohertz, how many users can we support using FDM? How many, how many users can we support? How many channels? Well, 
We can transmit a signal with a bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. Each user wants 15 kilohertz. If we have six channels, each user has 15 kilohertz. With six channels, that occupies, what, 90 kilohertz. So if we have some spacing between those channels, then that will probably bring us out to our 100 kilohertz. If we tried to fit in seven users, seven times is 105 kilohertz. We'd need a, a bandwidth of 105 kilohertz to, to support seven users, but we only have 100. So here we'd have an upper limit of supporting just six users in this link. A similar example is with Wi-Fi, our Wi-Fi access point on the wall here. With Wi-Fi, the bandwidth allocated for the range of Wi-Fi signals, uh, what is it? The wireless LAN, the total bandwidth is 80 megahertz. And again, we have different channels when we use Wi-Fi. We can, when an individual computer transmits a Wi-Fi signal, they don't use the full 80 megahertz. They use a particular center frequency, one channel. And the channel bandwidth, one channel, or one computer transmits at 22 megahertz. How many channels could we transmit on at the same time using Wi-Fi? Without interfering with each other. Three. Okay, if we use four, it would go up to 88 megahertz. We only have 80 megahertz available. Each channel occupies 22 megahertz. So each user, when they transmit a signal, their signal has a bandwidth of 22 megahertz. So what we could have is one user transmitting at the, at the lowest frequency range, or the one low channel, and another user transmitting at another channel such that their signals do not overlap. And a third user transmitting at the same time, and at the higher channel, again, so that none of those three signals overlap. So there's no interference between the users. Three individual or parallel transmissions happening at the same time. Does anyone know the number of channels supported in Wi-Fi? Anyone set up their Wi-Fi access point or router at home? You can sometimes select the channel. You've seen, or maybe you see the channel number when you connect, or uh, you often see channel numbers like channel one, channel six, channel eleven. It depends on the country. There's between eleven and thirteen channels available with Wi-Fi. But we said we can only have three channels that don't overlap. It turns out that you can have channel 1, channel 6, and channel 11, and they will not overlap when we transmit. But if you use channel 1 and channel 2, there's some overlap. And if I transmit on channel 1, and your device transmits on channel 2, they will interfere with each other. So that's not very effective. So in fact, with Wi-Fi, in the 2.4 gigahertz band, there are really three non-overlapping channels that we can use. So you'll often, people will often use channel numbers 1, 6, and 11. They're the three non-overlapping channels. It's frequency division multiplexing. Give each user a separate frequency such that they will not interfere with the others. The other approach, give each user a different time slot to transmit so that they will not interfere with the others. Time division multiplexing. Here, we'll transmit a signal between multiplexer and demultiplexer with the same bandwidth as the original source users. So we will not go up to 4B, but we'll transmit the same bandwidth. But to transmit the data from user A, we'll transmit for one short period of time so plotted versus time the signal here will transmit the data for user A for one period of time. 
then we'll stop transmitting his data and move on to the next user's data and transmit for a short period of time user B's data. And then after her data is sent, we send user C and then user D and then we come back to user A's data is transmitted for a short period of time and we keep going like that. We assign short, uh, short usually, it's usually short, but we assign time periods for each user, time slots they are called. You take in turns talking, essentially. So if multiple people want to communicate, then one speaks for a little bit, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one, then we come back to the first and we take in turns. All transmitting at a bandwidth of B. We divide by time. We divide the space into uh, the, the signal by time. The channel, uh, the, the link, only requires a bandwidth of B in this case. So coming back to our first example, with time division multiplexing, if our users required a bandwidth of 15 kilohertz, so this was FDM, if we use TDM, time division multiplexing, if the users had a bandwidth of 15 kilohertz, what's the total bandwidth needed for our link? With time division multiplexing, we just need the same as for each user, 15 kilohertz. That is, we don't need separate frequencies for each user. We all use the same frequency, but at different times. So here's a good thing about TDM. The users require 15 kilohertz, for example. Our link only needs to support 15 kilohertz. Whereas with FDM, if our users provide the same 15 kilohertz, our link would need to support 100 kilohertz in our example. If we, I think we had six users in our example. So FDM requires a larger bandwidth. Larger bandwidth, larger cost. That's the problem. What's the problem with TDM? Time division multiplexing. slow? In what way is it slow? <coughs> You're on the right track. It may be slow or performs worse under the same conditions. What? Why? Uh, the user only wants to use 15 kilohertz, say. Okay, so they still get their 15 kilohertz. The problem with TDM is that I transmit for some period of time and then I stop and wait for the others to transmit. Effectively, you don't get to send your data all the time. You only get to send it a portion of the time. So back to our slide. user A is not, tr the, or the data from user A is not being sent across this link all the time. It's only being sent one quarter of the time. With FDM, the data from user A is being sent across the link 100% of the time at a different frequency from the other users. Here it's four times worse performance because we only get to send one quarter of the time. The other three quarters of the time, the link is carrying other people's data. So it turns out that in terms of performance, FDM requires larger bandwidth, four times as much bandwidth, which is a bad thing. But the bad thing for TDM, you get four times as less performance. That is, if, uh, your, your data is only being sent one quarter of the time through the link. So effectively, they become the same in terms of performance. So it's a trade-off, uh, some, some differences in how to implement them as to which one's better. So they actually arrive at the same performance in theory because we either use four times the bandwidth or we get four times the less uh, time to transmit. And we also know, of course, bandwidth relates to data rate. 
If we use f four times the bandwidth, we can uh, get a higher data rate. So in other words, if we use TDM and 100 kilohertz, we could get a higher data rate per user, but they only get it to be sent one-sixth of the time, so the data rate per user becomes the same. With FDM and TDM under the same conditions for the link between A and B, the users will get a, about the same performance. TDM is used in a number of uh, other, we'll see some example, other digital transmission systems. Uh, it's common that nowadays when it's easier to generate the, the signal and split by time, and often more efficient. It also has the advantage with TDM is that uh, in some special cases, in the normal case, the assigning of time slots to, to user is fixed. It's always A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. If there's four users, they get one-fourth of the, the time to transmit. Uh, a more dynamic scheme would be to assign time slots based upon demand. If user A has a lot of data to send, users B, C, and D only have a little bit of data to send, maybe assign two time slots to user A and only one to, three, four, uh, to B, C, and D. So more complex schemes could be dynamically allocate time slots so that the users get better performance if they need it. And then later when they don't need it, you can give it to someone else. But that's outside of the scope of our topic today. That's it, multiplexing. Use a link to support the data of multiple users by either transmitting the signals of those users at different frequencies, FDM, or transmit the signals of those users at different times, time division multiplexing. Allowing the data from multiple users to be transported across one link. This approach, give the users a separate link, is often sometimes, or is sometimes referred to as space division multiplexing. Give them different space, physical space, a different link which is not common because it, in this case it's very expensive. To finish, where are they used? FDM is used in broadcast, cable TV, radio transmissions. Uh, some of the older long distance communications that a telecom company would set up links to cover Thailand. So to have links to go from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, in the older uh, cases they may have used FDM for some uh, wireless transmissions. Optical fiber used today uses the concept of frequency division multiplexing. You have a single fiber, you transmit the data from multiple users by sending light at different frequencies. What's the inverse of, a fre of frequency? Well, inver uh, uh, so, right. Uh, what's the 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 not direct inverse is proportionally in, uh, inverse proportional to the frequency is the wavelength. Okay, remember wavelength equals the speed of light divided by frequency. Speed of light is fixed. So wavelength division multiplexing is just another name for frequency division multiplexing. Frequency division multiplexing give the users different frequencies or give them different wavelengths. If you have a different frequency, you get a different wavelength. It just turns out when we talk about optical and light sources, we refer to the wavelength as opposed to the frequency. But it's the same concept. Your home ADSL internet. If you have internet using ADSL at home, the, the basic concept is to use frequency division multiplexing. You have a range of frequencies that you can send across your copper line, the copper telephone line. And this is one example where you, the frequencies are split into three channels or three ranges. The lower frequencies are used for transmitting your voice. When you make a normal voice call using your telephone line, a plain old telephone service, you transmit with the lower frequencies on that, that one copper uh, telephone line. 
A range of frequencies are used for upstream traffic, sending from your computer to the ISP, upload. And a range of frequencies used for downstream or download traffic. And those, the signals sent across the telephone line are split based upon frequency for voice, upload and download. Some you probably haven't heard of for TDM. Especially links across cities, between cities and between countries that are run by large telecom companies. They use nowadays time division multiplexing. Some of the names of the technologies which we will not talk about. Plesionchronous digital hierarchy, PDH, synchronous digital hierarchy and sonnet. Uh, some of the technologies used for wide area networks. We may mention them in a later topic when we come to LANs and WANs. We will not talk about multiple access right now. <laughs> 